well, you, you know, experiments don't work much of the time. <laughs> you know, the, the very easy ones have been done. <laughs> and so when you do things, you know that there'll be a certain number of times things just won't work. You keep trying, you try a different way. Um, w with telomerase, the initial experiments I'd done would be, had been done with trying to make certain kinds of fragments of DNA into a kind of a, a, a bait or a lure to try and lure out telomerase to show us its existence. And, uh, and, and I'd done a little tiny bit of work with this and seen, you know, the tiniest hint, maybe there was something working. And, you know, and Carol then took this on and said, OK, we're really going to make this work. But then the breakthrough was to not use fragments of DNA grown in bacteria, but to use very small, what are called oligonucleotides of DNA made in a chemical synthesizer where you can make more, right? And then that's what sort of, ah, that was the thing that made a big difference. So it, you know, it was very hard going and it wasn't at all assured of success. So even though it sounds smooth in retrospect, you know, there's lots of things that didn't work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to this day you try things out and some of them work and some of them don't. There's a lot of unpredictability in doing biology experiments. So you have to be able to put up with a lot of times things are not appearing to work. We started sometime around in May trying various things uh, to, to try to devise a way to find something that nobody had ever seen before. And so what we had to do was to test out a whole bunch of different things, just empirically, um, uh, to determine whether or not we could see something. So it was probably seven or eight months of doing that um, before we um, made this particular change in the way we did the experiment. And um, so I did the experiment. As I said, it was um, the, the experiment was actually set up sometime around uh, before Christmas time. And these kinds of experiments take four or five days for you to actually get the results. Um, and so, um, like I said, it was on Christmas Day that I came back in and developed the gel um, and saw this, uh, this result. And that Christmas and other Christmases, I always was important to, to be in the lab because uh, family things were very difficult. And so I wanted to have something to do. And so it was very nice that, you know, here I was uh, keep trying to keep focused and something great came out of it. <laughs> um, but um, there were uh, a couple of things that happened around that time. So I, I developed the gel that showed this pattern that it looked like the kind of pattern that we might expect. Um, and so I, I was able to, to think about it. And one of the, the things about my, my interaction with Liz is I always would try and, and sort of hide away for at least an hour or two with <laughs> new results. I, I, I recall at, at other times um, actually turning and going into another room when I saw her coming down the hall so I could sit and think with my data <laughs> for about 10 minutes because she was always so much quicker than I was <laughs> um, at, at getting to you know, what this essential thing meant. Um, so I did have, because I did develop it on Christmas Day, I had at least a day and a half to sit and think with the results um, and sort of, you know, mull over what they may, might mean. And then, of course, um, met with Liz, and we went over them together. Um, and because, again, it was Christmas time, just after that, um, I uh, took off for a, a, a trip that I was going to take. So I had another two or three weeks to sit on my own and try and plan out, well, now, what did I think the next set of experiments might be so that I could have some time to um, sort of think things through? And then was able to come back, and we could sit down together with uh, with Liz and, and go over things. Um, and so it was a it was a lot of fun uh, doing the interactions, the day to day interactions. Um, but because um, you know she'd already thought about things sometimes much more than I had, um, I tried to get some independence so that I could think about them. And then we would put our two heads together, you know, over a matter of days, um, and come up with even new ideas. Well, Carol had done this experiment, and we stood just in the lab. And I remember sort of standing there, and she had this, uh, we call it a gel. It's an autoradiogram, because there was traces amounts, trace amounts of radioactivity that were used to um, develop an image of the separated DNA products of what turned out to be the telomerase uh, enzyme reaction. And I remember looking at it and just thinking, ah, you know, this could be very big. This looks just right. It had a, a pattern to it. 
there was, you know, a regularity to it. There was something that was not just sort of garbage there. And, uh, and that was really kind of coming through, even though, you know, we look back at it now, we'd say, oh, well, technically, you know, there was this, that, and the other, but, you know, it, it, was, it was a pattern shining through, and, uh, and it just had this sort of sense, ah, there's something real here. But then, of course, you know, the good scientist has to be very skeptical and immediately say, OK, we're going to test this every way around here and really nail this one way or the other. You know, if it's going to be true, it has to be, you know, you have to make sure that it's true because you can get a lot of false leads, especially if you're wanting something to work. You don't dare dwell too long on uh, <laughs> excitement. But, but I did have this, ah, yes, you know, this, this is looking very, this sort of gut feeling, uh, this is looking good. And Carol had it, she, she knew. But, you know, again, we had to both do this sort of uh, tough testing of it. And we, there wasn't a set of rules by which to test it, right? So we had to sort of imagine, day, week, month after month, had to imagine all the possible um, things that could be that would make the whole thing fall on its face and look like it was just a false lead. But you had to keep thinking of more and more possibilities because, you know, nature is kind of complicated and uh, there's lots of things that can go wrong and, you know, you don't want to fool yourself. So, uh, so that process uh, went on for quite a while. But uh, in a way it was, you know, it's sort of like an intellectual thing. You're trying to say, can you, can you be smarter than nature in a way? Can you, can you dig something out? that's been hard to find. Telomerase, there's not a lot of telomerase. I mean, this is why it didn't show up, you know, 20, 30 years ago. There's not a lot of it. It had to be, you know, teased out and uh, distinguished against all of the other kinds of things, all of the other enzymes in cells that do related but not the same kinds of things. There was a lot of evidence that was already um, around that there was um, something going on at the ends of chromosomes where DNA sequences could be added on to the ends um, and that they were dynamic in some manner. Um, there were some competing hypotheses as to how that DNA might be added on to the ends. Um, and there was a very popular um, competing hypothesis um, which was um, talked about a lot by some famous people who I who I respected a lot. Um, and that uh, particular thing was a recombination-based model for adding sequences onto the ends of chromosomes. Um, so I, I do recall feeling um, a little bit um, uh, intimidated by the fact that there were some really major groups out there who thought that this, the same process could be done by a different kind of a mechanism. And so who was I to think that I could, you know, grind up some cells and find some new enzyme that nobody had ever um, found before. Um, no, nevertheless, we thought, well, you know, maybe it's not done the way they think it's done. Um, and so, um, you know, you come in the lab every day and do the next experiment and just keep chugging away like one does in a lot of things in life and you just take the next step. And, um, and then we found this evidence that the enzyme actually existed. Well, when I first saw the first result um, that Christmas day, there was a pretty clear recognition of what it might be. And I, I remember being very excited, but within hours, um, all the things went through my mind about what else it could be, but not what I thought. What other things could be fooling me and look like that and not really be a new enzyme? Um, and so then we set about um, you know, challenging ourselves to prove that it wasn't a lot of other things that were already known that were fooling us. And I, I think that the, the point where I really believed that it really was real, because I wouldn't even allow myself to believe it, it was, it was very interesting, um, was an experiment, um, I guess it was the experiment using the yeast oligo, yes. and have the yeast yes. oligo do the same thing, right. Right. which was probably, I would say, maybe five or six months later that we actually did that experiment and got the result. Um, and, and I do remember then that night going home and, and um, having had that result and just being very excited about it and thinking, okay, this really is something new. Um, so it was probably a good six months of, of testing various other alternative hypotheses before 
really believing it. Um, and I remember turning up the rock and roll and dancing <laughs> all by myself <laughs> in my room <laughs> at home. <laughs> Actually, that first gel, it really sort of, it said so, it was such an unusual pattern to see that it's really spoke and said, yes, I think this is this is it. And then, of course, as you say, all of, all the questions you know that any responsible person is going to ask, right? <laughs> that this isn't just wishful thinking, right? You can always wish to see what you want to see. But there was this real qualitative difference in the previous. You know, there'd been a little hint here, this sort of thing. But this was kind of ah, there was a pattern. You know, I think we love patterns. This produced a kind of pattern of tiger stripes, <laughs> right? You know, I think our eyes like to see these sorts of things. And I think our view of how this enzyme works, you know, is still very dominated by this kind of visual pattern. But I do have this real gut sense. Ah, yes, this really, really looks uh, important and new here. So, uh, but you know, you have these two things that go on in science. You have this, you know, yes, this is, um, really good and I want to do this and then at the same time as Carol was saying this morning we have to also be very sort of strict because you know you know yourself you're the, the most likely to be deluded because you're the one who wants it to work right so you also have to kind of play these two things off against each other where you know your enthusiasm for the project has to kind of feed into your enthusiasm to make it sure as well because uh, you know in science, you're trying to get at what's real, right? I was trained with uh, somebody called Fred Sanger, who won a Nobel Prize first for sequencing proteins, and he was working on sequencing of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, but then DNA when I was a PhD student with him. And, uh, and so there was very few ways of sequencing DNA then. And one of the things you could do was sequence DNA at the very ends of the long DNA molecules that make up genomes. And so I saw that there would be a feasibility, a way of looking at the ends of DNA, uh, whereas perhaps in those days you couldn't look at the middle of DNA so well. And I went to Joe Gall's lab and was interested in um, pursuing this. And Joe Gall, who I mentioned before, was a really good mentor, was also an extremely good biologist in recognizing there are good biological systems for asking certain questions. And he was the one who said, there's this system that has very small, short chromosomes, that, and lots of them, meaning lots of ends, so that uh, uh, this would be something that, you know, this would be a system. And I was excited because I wanted to look at the ends of things, the ends of DNA, which nobody really had been able to look at. Uh, in, in eukaryotes, you know, organisms like us that have nuclei in their cells. And so, so it was partly that it was doable and partly because there was a good system to do it in, so that's very pragmatic. But as soon as I started looking at the molecular behavior, there was something unusual about the way the DNA was behaving and then subsequent experiments uh, by us and by others, you know, over the next few years, said, ah, there's something going on here which is, which is different. So now, why are they important? So now, you know, fast forwarding, jump ahead now to much more what we know. We, we know that the, uh, the genetic material is in long thread-like molecules, DNA molecules, and they have, each DNA molecule has two ends, and the ends have to be protected, otherwise they kind of chemically fray away every time the cells multiply. And so it turned out to be particularly important to cells that they protect the ends, and furthermore that they replenish the ends of DNA. And it was that replenishment that was going on and giving rise to the strange behavior of the DNA that made us first uh, suspicious and then Carol and I then, you know, we, okay, we'll look for and look for telomerase. So we didn't stumble over telomerase. It was something that uh, there was some reason to think might exist, but would take some real digging in to get it. If you put in a certain kind of telomere into a cell of a different species, then you could see telomeric DNA being added directly onto the end of the DNA that was put in. And that was something that was not predicted. 
there were also a few other little hints. There was the behavior of telomeres as you watched the behavior of telomeres as cells continued to multiply, then the telomeres would get longer and shorter sometimes. So that was an odd behavior. And uh, there was a, a genetic argument uh, in corn, which you know none of this is proof positive. These were all interesting things that came together into one idea. There was genetic evidence in corn that was suggestive that uh, there might be a real function uh, for doing something at the ends of chromosomes, and that could have been lots of things, but it happened that this idea that was coming together from these different kinds of observations, it was fitting into one kind of possibility, and that was that there was something new there. So um, th those are the things that led into thinking that there might be such an activity, a set of experimental observations that didn't fit into the previously known um, facts. And that's because nobody had looked at, at telomeres before. It wasn't as if people had been looking at them before and not seeing it. It really was something relatively new to even be looking at the telomeric DNA. It's the um, protective end of the chromosome. And the chromosome is this you know, thread-like body that there's lots of them in our cells. And each chromosome carries some of our genetic blueprint. So together, all the chromosomes add up to our total genetic blueprint. But it's packaged in the form of lots of uh, chromosomes. And each chromosome has to have its end protected. And that's because, essentially, things in the cell attack <laughs> DNA ends unless they have special protective mechanisms. As a postdoctoral fellow, I'd um, gone to Joe Gall's lab, and he had suggested, uh, he had found small linear molecules, short uh, DNAs, uh, in high copy number, and uh, that gave an unusual opportunity to look at the ends of the molecules, because if you have very few, very long molecules, you don't have too many ends, but if you have lots and lots of very short linear molecules, you have lots of ends. So he knew that biological system and uh, had found these molecules, and so the two came together. So it was just a little pond scum organism, you know, <laughs> it doesn't do anybody any harm, it swims in ponds and uh, happens to have lots of, um, lots of chromosomes. So that was the way I'd got into looking at the DNA, and then it seemed reasonable, and luckily it was true, that if there was lots of DNA ends, then as we were going to embark on the hunt for this new enzyme, that there might be lots of the enzyme that made uh, this extra DNA. So we stayed with tetrahymena, and you can grow buckets and buckets of it and uh, you know, get lots of material to, to work with, not too expensively. Well, uh, I, I was a professor at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, and um, we, we have a graduate research program. A graduate program, students come to the program to do their PhD work, which means doing um, research in molecular biology. So um, the program attracts terrific students, and one of them was Carol, and then the students choose a lab and a project that they'll do research in, and uh, I had the great good fortune that Carol chose to work in, in my lab. I remember the day that we, we actually met. Um, it was during the interviews when I was up interviewing for graduate schools. And I guess um, at Berkeley, I had actually been accepted. Um, and then I went around to talk to professors just to decide whether I wanted to go there or not. And um, I had a great time in my conversation with Liz. She was just very excited about what she was doing. And I was having such a, a great time talking to her that the time went by so fast, and I really wanted to know more. And I remember I asked you if I could come back <clears throat> and talk a little bit more, um, because I was staying um, just up the road in, in Davis. Um, and then between when I came back um, and when I'd left, my father had a heart attack and I ended up in the hospital. Um, but I did everything I could to come down, because I was going to go back and, and, and talk to you some more. And, um, and that was sort of the, the thing that, that um, clinched for me that what I wanted to do was to go to Berkeley and to work in Liz's lab. <laughs> that that was, you know, typically one goes to a university and then chooses a lab once, once you go there. Um, but, um, but that was sort of my goal after, uh, after meeting her. 
And Carol's not your typical person. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, you, you, you see things and you say, I'm going to go for it. Yeah, it wasn't you, guaranteed the way, the way the program was set up. Right. Um, you had to do three lab rotations. So I worked in three different labs and did a little project in three labs. And officially, you're not allowed to make any agreements about where you're going to go until the end of those rotations. Um, and I don't know if it was uh, because um, everyone else in my class knew that what I wanted to do was go back and work for Liz <laughs> or how it worked out. But uh, I do remember the day when I, at the very end of the third rotation, when I came in and said, I'd like to come back. And she said, sure. <laughs> and, 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 and that was, uh, I was quite happy about that. Let's see, that would have been 84, um, that would have been June, no, May of 84. And then um, the official first, first piece of evidence that we that said, had to long this is it. Yes. was uh, Christmas Day of 84. So December 31st, December 25th. Hey, 25th. <laughs> right. December 25th. Um, and then another year until our first publication on it. Yeah. To, yeah. But you jumped right in, right from the start because you know, knowing what you wanted to do was right. something that so from May sort of let, December. you know, sometimes people sort of cast around a little bit here and there for projects, but Carol knew that this was one that was going to be one she wanted to get involved in, and so it was something. Well, I remember asking you when I first came to ask, could A, could I work in your lab, and B, could I, could I do this could project? I do this? You said yes, yes. to both. <laughs> yes. So happy to have someone to agree to do this project, which was, you know, a daring thing because, because the idea was, well, there's maybe something that hadn't been described before, right? And so to, um, to look for something new is, is not something that wise people, <laughs> normally <laughs> prudent people would do young in science. Nice. Yeah, so being, being young and hopeful and also... Um, you know, I just got tenure and I had research money and, and that gave me a lot of um, mental freedom too, to say, okay, I can kind of do something which if I'd written it as a planned research project, um, you know, funding agencies who fund would said it would have said, well, but is this even feasible? Well, of course you don't know if there's something that's new. You don't know if it's feasible. So, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of felt I, I had the confidence to go ahead and uh, have the lab and you know have our energies go into something something new I wouldn't call them setbacks um, like I said we took about six months before um, from the first hint that the enzyme existed before I was pretty much convinced that it really was what it was so all along I kept trying to think of how could this data be fooling me? How could it be some other kinds of activity that just looks like this? Because I think I want it to look like this. How could I be fooling myself? And then finding a, a you know, thinking, well, maybe it's this other process, finding a way to test that, and all along the way. So there were points along the way when I thought, oh, well, it, maybe it's not telomerase at all, but you know, it's a DNA polymerase that's copying uh, you know, repetitive DNA. So there, there were little bits of doubt along the way, but that was part of the process of verifying. You know, we ended up jumping through the hoops, and you know, every hoop you always worried about what was going to be on the other side of the hoop. But by jumping through them all, at the end, um, we were fairly convinced. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the way it ended up working out, um, and, and a lot of labs work this way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also to the point now where I don't do a lot of experiments on my own in the lab, although that's what I like to do, and that's why I got into science. You end up going into slightly different positions, so I'm more of a manager and a data analyst for the people that are working for me. Um, and so at that point, you know, Liz was probably working in the lab then more than I am now, um, but I was there ready to do the experiments, so I was the one doing all of the actual hands-on experiments, and she and I would talk about them. Um, and so as it evolved over the um, course of the four and a half years that I was in her lab, I did all of the, all of the actual hands-on experiments. Um, and, and you know, she was very gracious in letting me continue to do that, even when it was you know, clearly as exciting as it was, that you know, I started it and I got to, to finish it. And, it was, uh, and so you know, that's... Uh, it was maybe slightly unusual.
it's relatively unusual, you know, now women coming into degrees is become very usual. Women coming into assistant professorships was, you know, not so, but pretty unusual. And, um, and so I think I'm going to turn your question around a little bit, but just to say what has been interesting, and I think it did make a difference that there were two women in the field, is that in our field, a lot of people come and they say, gosh, there's so many people, so many women in the field of telomeres and telomerase. And, and my first thought is, well, of course there aren't so many, it's just sort of the reasonable number of people. And then I realized, of course, compared with most other fields, it is a lot of women. So I think that that has made some difference, and I, in, and I think in it's part, terrific. In part, women feel more comfortable working in women's labs. I think that's some, yes. some amount of it. Um, and, you know, seeing the role models that are there. But, um, I mean, for a long time, my lab um, at Cold Spring Harbor when I was there was filled with entirely women. There were, you know, eight people, and they were all women. Um, and... Um, so I think that there's a certain amount of, of people seeking out to work in the lab of, of role yes. models. And then, of course, the people that then graduate from the lab go on and populate the field. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that um, a particular field might be you know, founded by women or uh, actually, I think in this case, it might be founded by, uh, by Joe Gall, who, who is a, a man that <laughs> who, who, was a, who was very supportive right, of women. That's right, a good um, mentor of women. And right. because of that, there were a large number of women that, that came into the field. Um, so it's a, a jackpot event. If you, not such if a large sense. number, but significant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, they were, right. the numbers, the absolute numbers were not, not huge. But, but relative to yes, other fields. That's right, right. But it is great. You know, we co-organized a scientific conference last year. About 250 people came. Many of them, you know, happened to be women scientists. And, uh, and it is great. It's a real sort of, uh, you know, terrific sense to, to see an area of research in which it's not the usual sort of demographics of relatively few women there among the speakers and among yeah. the invited participants and, and, and attendees and so forth. Because what happens is that even though women come into PhDs at about equal numbers to men, more and more as you look at what happens as careers progress, and this is no surprise, excepting the numbers you know, get much, much sparser as one advances in the career. And the old argument used to be it was the pipeline. They used to say, well, there were very few women in the pipeline. Can't hide behind that anymore. It's not true. Lots of women are coming in and have been coming in for a few decades you know, in large numbers into these sorts of um, scientific fields. I, uh, so you go ahead. I, I yeah, had the good yeah. fortune to um, be involved in writing the grant that we put together for, to fund this meeting that we did on telomeres uh, two years ago. And typically when one writes a, a grant for, um, for funds for a meeting, um, there are certain uh, you know, boilerplate clauses that have to go in. And a lot of the funding agencies make sure that you want to invite um, women, minorities, and you have to state in there that you're going to go out of your way to invite these people. And so I had a little fun, and I wrote my little boilerplate paragraph and changed it around to say, well, there are so many women in the telomere field that we will try to go out of our way and invite some men. <laughs> <laughs> and this got past the, the people at Coldspring Harbor that had to, to vet the, the grant. And so I was quite pleased that that actually went to the funding agency. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so I hope it's sort of a model for, you know, hey, you know, and an encouragement that, um, look, there can be fields, great science gets done. It doesn't have to be, you know, one group, one gender or another who particularly dominate it. It's, it, it, it is, you know, and inadvertently, you know, it wasn't like it was planned, but it's clearly evolved in that direction. So in answer to your question, it is a little unusual, and I hope it will be less unusual. I think I was very lucky because I, I knew I was interested in living things from very, very young. And uh, I grew up in Australia, and uh, I would, would, my mother tells me this, you know, I have no direct recollection, but I remember I would uh, um, pick up little poisonous ants and poisonous jellyfish. There are a lot of poisonous creatures in Australia, and I would pick them up and sort of pet them, and I really liked them, and I was interested in them. And of course, you know, this was horrifying. For my mother, you know, as a physician, you could see, you know, the stinging and the <laughs> potential biting that would take place. But I seem to have lucked out. I never got bit by any of these. And uh, I, I think I've just known for a long time I was fascinated by living things. So I loved animals. And then in high school, as I started learning about, um, you know, what's in living things, I got very fascinated 
by what was then called biochemistry. Protein chemistry was something that was, uh, you know, the field then. And, and I got fascinated by what are the building blocks of living things, cells and molecules. So I feel very fortunate because even in high school, I kind of knew it was biology. I knew that was what fascinated me. And I, and I pretty much knew that it was going to be something looking, as I saw it, looking you know, deep into how these things really work, which then was called biochemistry and then became more molecular and more cell biology with the years. So I went you know, through high school knowing fairly much that this would be where I would go, perhaps not even thinking about it all that much. I just kind of fortunately knew. But uh, you know, in Australia, socially, th there was very much a strong sense that you know, women didn't do certain kinds of careers. I was in high school once when somebody said, this is an adult, not my teacher, but some other teacher said, what's a nice girl like you doing going into science? I just remember that vividly. And I was, you know, you know I, I didn't lash out at this person <laughs> because, you know, I, I kind of socially didn't know how to do that. But I just remember thinking, you know, that's, that's interesting and I'm not going to basically have any interaction with that person anymore, right? Because this person, you know, didn't seem to get that this was something that... I, I cared about. And so then I moved on to a degree and then the training. You know, and, and again, as I say, I was so fortunate that I knew pretty much what kinds of things interested me. And I feel very lucky also because I was in a system, unlike the system in the US where students have much more access to a broad undergraduate degree, we had to pretty much make our decision a lot earlier about the kind of degree we were going to take. And at one point, I decided I wanted to look for a history of a history and philosophy of science class. I thought, I'd love to take a class like that. And my schedule wouldn't allow it. But in going around to all the professors and trying to find out if I could make a schedule where I could take these classes, you know, I was met with such um, you know, surprise. Why would you want to do this? <laughs> so so you know, for somebody who didn't know what they were interested in, this, this could have been a very bad situation, because you would get sucked into an undergraduate degree and perhaps specialize much earlier. So I think the system in the US that I see when I was teaching at Berkeley and the undergraduates all take much, much more breadth of courses than, than we did. So I think that's, that's a good system because you know, not everybody is going to have the good luck to know pretty early what, what kinds of things are interesting to them. I think that there were various teachers throughout. I had a good, a good math teacher who kind of, just by um, you know, getting me to do something in front of the class, show, show some problem solving in front of the class, kind of let me see, oh, yes, I can, I can do that. Not that math was my greatest, strongest subject, but you know, he, he let me see, yes, I've got this ability. I can, I can do things that I hadn't really thought I uh, could do. And especially when I was doing high school, you know, my sense is there was much less awareness compared to the way there is now about the way women relate to science and math and how in a mixed group of girls and boys, you know, the boys tended to be more outgoing and so forth. And now I look back at him and I think, he was an extraordinary teacher because he drew me out, you know, and, and he did this. Um, made me realize in a way that perhaps most other teachers wouldn't have taken the time to. So he was important. This was at, um, at a university, it's called University High School in Melbourne, Australia. Mr. Stuttered was his name. We always call our teachers Mr. Stuttered. Len Stuttered, good, good teacher, good math teacher. And, uh, and then I had, um, you know, I had a, a good, uh, my PhD was done in Cambridge in England. And I had a couple of uh, professors in Australia when I was an undergraduate where I was doing some research and they had been to two different places. One had been to Rockefeller University, one had been to Cambridge, England. And they both said, you know, these are, you, you really should think of going and doing your further um, training, you know, one of these places. And uh, the Rockefeller one, he said, well, the books used to get so dirty with all the pollution. I thought, oh, okay, well, I better not go to New York. <laughs> right? So, you know, I'm really shocked at the triviality of, of the things that make you make decisions. But, uh, but they encouraged me. And, you know, and, and also, they gave me a project. 
And this was right around the time of the moon shot. We went across the street to the apartment of somebody who had a TV. Not everybody had a TV, right? So we could watch this. We had this great, we watched this, you know, amazing thing. We all came back. And then I was doing my little biochemical analyses and nothing had fallen into place. And, uh, and I lost a whole lot of the sample. <laughs> I thought, you know, this is not, not a good day for my science. But then very soon after, the same samples, I analyzed them, and I suddenly thought about them in a different way. And suddenly, everything fell into place, and ah, yes, now I understood what was going on. So I remember that very well, because there was this sort of juxtaposition of, you know, the moon's triumph, you know, my technical failure, and then very quickly after, I, somehow things just kind of fell into place. You know, it was a very trivial problem now, but at the time, that process of going through it was, was something that I suddenly realized, you know, the addiction to science, that, ah, you've suddenly seen a way through, you've seen how something is, you know, you've understood how something works. So uh, that, was, that was important, to have that opportunity to be doing research. And uh, Carol alluded earlier to um, Joe Gall, who was a professor at Yale University with whom I did my postdoctoral research. And he was a very important mentor because he, again, gave people who came and worked with him a kind of self-respect and a kind of respect of them and uh, made them feel perhaps very, you know, safe such that they could blossom as scientists. And both men and women were, you know, I think very um, positively influenced. But for women, it did particularly, I think, make a difference. So again, the character and... Uh, um, you know, the way a mentor can work in science is, is very important in influencing, you know, I, I found was very important in influencing how I felt about my going on to do science. There was one by a guy called, I think it's Gamal, Gamoff, and I got this book from the Melbourne Library. Melbourne has a very hot summer. There was this, you know, and this was a city built in the 19th century as though it was Britain, right? You know, the British would build their cities and they would just say, this is Britain. So there was this huge sort of classical arcade library. And so uh, in the summer, no air conditioning. So I'd go into this library, you know, partly because you could cool off a little. <laughs> and so I went into this library, and there was this book by Gamal, and he was just writing this imaginative, sort of interesting, uh, provocative science. It was a popular book, and it was about, you know, what is life about and the codes and so forth. And I, I was very intrigued and captured by, by that book. My parents were both physicians um, of the family physician type. No, you're not fancy researchers or anything like that. that. And, and I picked up a sense of this idea that you, you do serve, you serve people, actually. I think that was, it's an interesting thing. That, that, and I don't think they ever said that in any explicit term. But you could just see in terms of how, you know, you know, individual patients weren't discussed, but just certain things were discussed. And uh, you, you could see that that was important, that you, you know, were doing something bigger than yourself. You were doing something for, um, for society. And, you know, for some reason, I, I was able to pick up on that. So I think that, that influenced, especially my mother, who was a physician who, um, you know, spent a lot of her hours in, you know, in in the office talking to her patients and she you know would say talking was so important for many of her patients sometimes there weren't even obvious uh you know things that a physician could do something about but she said it meant a lot to them and i remember that was interesting you know and i could see what a broad sort of uh, field medicine was uh, and i also kind of knew that it wasn't my field either you know i knew science was something that I would be much more interested in doing. I think there's a great irony in, in this because in some ways, in working in the laboratory, you, you, you really have to work with humans so much because who does the science? You know, how, how do things advance, right? It's people. It's people thinking and being you know, committed to doing work and so forth. And so um, you know, much, much more of science than anyone ever tells you or that you suspect <laughs> is, is to do 
with with people. And in a way, I think a great irony is, in, at least you know, in some ways, the doctor-patient relationship is almost more remote. You know, in science, you're very much uh, dealing with with people, your colleagues, your students. Um, you know, the, the, they're all very very important to you because their success and your success is all bound up together because the science is difficult. So you know, you have to. Um, work in a very integrated way. I have um, four sisters and two brothers. I'm the second of our family of seven. I read somewhere about uh, the psychology of second siblings, and, uh, and I hate to say all those things. It seemed like if I could check them all off, it sounded all like me. You know? <laughs> Oh, some of the things about um, you know you needing to find your place and you, your independence and things like that, right? Um, you know, I was very very close to my older sister. Now she went into the medical side of things. So she's a she's a physician and, and a hematologist, and uh, and you know we had a very close relationship, and I greatly admired her. But uh, and that might have been partly related to the fact. Perhaps I didn't want to try and just emulate and do exactly the same thing as she did. You know, perhaps I wanted to find my own niche, and perhaps that's why I went into science. You know, I don't know if that played into it. But I noticed that all seven of us, it's like we each chose something as different as possible from the other. So we have the hematologist, me, the scientist, my next sister. It was a kindergarten teacher, you know, very talented at little kids I was you know I never realized what a talent that takes until I had our own son and saw you know what insights she had and then my brother who's a mining production engineer my other brother who's a musician and a sister who was a high school science teacher and uh, and still is and then my um, younger sister who went into pottery and now is running a computer graphics firm <laughs> so, a company that does computer graphics so it's like we all took everything as different as possible from the others, and kind of made our own little uh, uh, sort of niche or our own little areas. Even though, you know, nobody ever stated that explicitly in our family. Nobody ever specifically said, "I'm going to do something different from somebody else." But here we all did. Yeah, encouraging again, particularly my mother. Um, I think she encouraged me in things that um, gave me a, a sense of self-worth such that you know, I knew what I chose would be respected. And I remember things like when I was, uh, I used to play the piano a lot. Um, you know, I remember she drove me to some, you know, there was some piano competition, you know, just a local thing, and, and she drove me. And not long ago, I looked on the map and realized this distance she had driven me you know, way across the state. Well, it was the state of Tasmania, which is the smallest state in Australia. But still, she'd driven me this huge long way, you know, just for the, me to play this piece of music and, uh, you know, and come back. And, uh, you know, so I remember just feeling that whatever I chose, I, I knew would feel relatively validated. Although I remember once, and this was interesting, my mother once, I think she was trying to tell me, you know, there are certain, you can do things in certain ways, it doesn't have to be all one way. And I remember at one stage she said, when I was a teenager, she said, you know, you don't have to go to university, meaning, you know, to college. And I think she was responding to the fact that I was putting myself under all this pressure, right? And I remember feeling really mad at that, <laughs> you know, what did it mean? <laughs> so, so, and I didn't say to her, what do you mean about this? I just kind of listen to it. And, uh, but I, I remember kind of a little resolve hardening in me. And then I, now, you know, I look back at it, you know, not so long after it had happened and realized what, what the dynamic was, that, that she was saying, you know, stop killing yourself here. You know, you're going to be okay. You know, different ways to do different things. When, when I was in late, a late, you know, teenagerhood, she started to have some signs of clinical depression. And, uh, and you know, for us, we didn't. As the kids, we actually didn't really understand, for a while, what was going on, and, uh, and you know, it was hard because we didn't really have people to talk to it about. Uh, about it. Um, people didn't really talk about these things a whole lot, and uh, and so I remember, you know, we kind of each dealt with it in our own kind of individual way. But now I look back and I think it's interesting that perhaps society was in this way that. You know, even friends didn't sort of discuss it with us and say, well, you know, we see what's going on, we understand what's going on. So, um, yeah, it, it was tough, and she's suffered on and off 
you know, all, all, you know, through her adult life. She's done basically fine. And, and I think in a way it sort of made a fam our family, especially us kids, you know, we're sort of very, um, very supportive of each other and, and of her. My father is now deceased, but, you know, I think there's been a sort of, it's been a very strengthening thing, but it was, it was tough at the time. And especially, as I say, people didn't talk about it a whole lot. That just wasn't what people then felt they, you know, talked about or didn't understand or something. It wasn't something that it seemed that people comfortably talked about. So uh, we had some very good, uh, some, some relatives in Melbourne, you know, and people and like that who, who, you know, in the family, they talked with us about it and, and were very supportive of us. But it wasn't something that, you know, you went and you talked to your friends about. And I think now it's better because I think people do speak much more openly about it. And when, you know, somebody's dealing with this, they, they talk about it. My father was a physicist at UC Davis, uh, academic uh, physicist, and my mother was a biologist, although she died when I was six, and so I didn't really uh, know her. So uh, my getting into biology, I think, is more of a uh, <laughs> my own thing rather than necessarily following, uh, following what she was doing. Uh, so they were both PhDs, uh, both PhDs from UC Berkeley. So it's a, a family thing since I, I also got my degree there. He didn't encourage me to be a scientist. Um, one of the things I remember most from my father was that um, he was very clear that it didn't matter what we did as long as we loved what we did. We had to you know, just do whatever you want and make sure it's what you love doing. Um, and I think that uh, retroactively I look back on the conversations that we had with him and realize that there, probably that's where my very strong um, ideal has come from for um, I think of it more sort of in terms of academia, that I, I have a, a, a strong penchant in that direction. Basically, to have, be able to have the freedom to do whatever you want is the most important thing. But it's more important to do what you want than it is to make money. That was never, making money was never an issue. Um, we never valued in any way, so aside that you could, you know, put food on the table. Um, and all throughout high school, he would always tell us, um, that the important thing is to do what you want for yourself. You know, we would never get $5 for getting an A or anything like that when there are other uh, school friends that would get paid for getting good grades. And my father said, you do it for yourself. Um, and basically, you don't want to shut any doors. You know, all the doors are open to you now. If you do well, you'll keep the doors open. And he convinced us somehow um, to go ahead that way. I do recall that when I was in seventh and eighth grade and uh, getting straight A's in science that I was teased a fair amount and, you know, oh, what are you going to do, become a scientist? You know, why, why did you get another A? Um, and I remember vehemently de denying that. No, I'm just, I just, it was easy. And so I got an A because it was easy. I'm not going to become a scientist. Um, because it was, you know, when you're teased, you <laughs> deny it. <laughs> um, but it didn't stop me from really doing what I wanted um, in the end. But I, I do recall having that reaction. I think it was a, re a social reaction. You know, there were, there were, I remember a group of students talking to me That's and teasing me about the fact yeah. that you know, I had gotten A's all semester and this, and well, therefore she must be wanting to be a scientist. I don't know if I specifically thought it was too brainy, but um, I, I think it was more of a, I said, a social reaction to being teased, just to deny that that's, that's, that was my, my end goal. I've been influenced a number of different points. Um, along the way by people that were very interesting. And so I know that when I chose to go to UC Santa Barbara um, for my undergraduate, I uh, grew up in a university town in Davis and everybody from my high school either went to UC Davis or UC Berkeley. And I wasn't gonna do that. <laughs> I was gonna go somewhere else. But I still stayed within the UC system. And um, when I got to, uh, to Santa Barbara, there was a woman I met, um, B. Sweeney, who was a biologist there. And I was very much captivated by her. Um, my father and, and my mother had actually known her um, from their own uh, scientific travels. Um, and so I was set up with her to uh, get a tour of the campus when I was touring campuses during high school. Um, and she was a very captivating person. And so I pretty much went to Santa Barbara because I wanted to you know, 
work with her in some capacity. They had a, a special college that she was involved with there. Um, and it was uh, through my interactions with her that I then began to learn what I was really interested in. I tried a lot of different things, actually. <clears throat> I, um, I, I thought that I might be interested in ecology, and so I, she set me up in a lab with an ecologist. And the, the, the most important thing that she did for me was to emphasize how important it was to get into a lab early on. And she got me into a lab um, as a freshman. And so as a result, I was able to try out a whole bunch of different labs. And I worked in maybe four or five different labs as an undergraduate. And then it was pretty clear to me um, what I liked doing. Um, because it's easy to tell when you're in, at least for me, when I'm in doing something, what it is that I'm good at and what I enjoy, which I think are, are mutually reinforcing. Um, and it wasn't until I got into a, a biochemistry lab, um, I worked in Les Wilson's lab on uh, microtubule dynamics, that, um, that I really knew that that's, that's what I liked. Um, so I didn't really have any concept of biochemistry or molecular biology um, before I went to college. There have been a number of instances when I've made choices having to do with um, people that I, I like to interact with. And so I think of one, my choice to go to, um, uh, to Santa Barbara because I had met B. Sweeney and I really liked my interaction with her and um, she ended up being my advisor there. Um, and then when I was interviewing for, um, to go to graduate school, um, I interviewed at Caltech and at Berkeley. And I did the Caltech interviews about Ten interviews with different professors, and then a couple weeks later went to Berkeley, and so by then I had a sense of you know talking to people and what it was like doing these interviews for graduate school, and I was just very struck by my interactions with Liz, and um, I was really excited about science, and so again I made up my mind then that I was going to go to Berkeley um, and not go to to Caltech, and that what I wanted to do was to to work in her lab. But again, that wasn't necessarily a guarantee that I was going to be able to do that. It wasn't like we had some agreement. It wasn't for many months later that, um, that that worked out. I could see connections being made in my mind about what was going on. Both, it's probably a combination about what she was describing in her research and who she was and who I was. Um, and so um, I thought I wanted to, to be in that environment. So um, did what I could to to get there. I didn't really think to the medical applications. The, the excitement was more, ah, this is understanding how something is working. But I think it's, it's always been true in biology, and you always know in a corner of your mind that certain things in basic sciences, you know, are going to end up with unexpected ramifications. But it wasn't consciously a situation of saying, well, going to set out and study aging, going to set out and study cancer. And, and I think this is very typical of how, you know, much science happens because, you know, when you're trying to be innovative and trying to kind of push back what we understand, you know that there's going to be an unpredictable nature to, you know, how things will work out. And we still don't know how, how this will work out in terms of medical applications, but I think it's something that's caught imagination of people, and it's certainly something that should you know, definitely be looked at more because you know, we have very blunt weapons against cancer these days. You know, we don't have great weapons against cancer. Anything that uh, looks promising should be tried, and there's certain aspects of telomeres and telomerase that are very, very germane to cancer, for example, or any situation where cells keep on multiplying. The basic observation is that without telomerase, then the DNA of chromosomes kind of uh, wears down a little bit each time cells multiply. And what telomerase does is replenish that DNA and adds it, adds it back on again so that there's no overall continuous loss as cells continue multiplying. And then eventually as they continue multiplying and start losing DNA a little bit too much, then this talking to the cells that I mentioned goes on where a cell will um, get a message from its telomeres that says, you know, I'm not being replenished, you know, hey, stop multiplying to 
put it in anthropomorphic terms. And, uh, and that's partly because the cells, you know, they have to protect their genetic material. And they say, you know, this DNA sends a signal, stop everything, don't go any further, we've got a problem here. And some cells just simply sit there and never multiply again. Some cells in our body altruistically commit suicide for you. And they say, you know, this is a dangerous situation. This DNA could go badly awry. And they, they kindly commit suicide when that happens. So there are ways in which uh, not having the DNA replenished through having active telomerase sets off signals in cells which stop them multiplying. And we know that as we age, certain cells do lose some of their ability to multiply. So it's very tempting to think that perhaps if one could replenish back telomerase, perhaps one could keep that multiplying capability of cells. So would that be good or would that be bad? And this is where we get completely into the unknown complexity of the whole human body. We can't just have cells multiplying out of sight. And there's a very bad category of cells that keep multiplying, of course, and those are cancer cells. And one thing cancer cells do is they just love telomerase. And I, that's very unscientific. What I mean is that telomerase gets selected for in cancer cells. It helps them keep proliferating against all the odds. And so in that way, it's um, uh, an activity of cells which, when it's not regulated, helps cancer cells to keep on multiplying and uh, so clearly, there's a, one extreme, and the other extreme is no telomerase. And somewhere is uh, some biological you know, window in which there may be some useful potential applications. I don't think there's a single panacea far from it. You know, would it, would it that biology was so simple, but we can't fool ourselves. There might be useful applications, for sure. So I think... This is something that, you know, shouldn't be allowed to not, you know, to, shouldn't be allowed to just be dropped. But on the other hand, we shouldn't have unrealistic hopes either. I have my daily dose of telomerase, but it's, you know, in the mind, right? I mean, it's <laughs> the intellectual fun right, of it. But um, I mean, people joke about that, but, uh, you know, it's it's just one of those it's it's a it's a sort of an attractive idea without any particular uh, immediate outlook right now but on paper it's okay but you know how many wonderful ideas have been thought of to cure cancer or aging on paper but but you know we're inching forward there are other things that we are starting to understand about aging and the interplay of all the cells in our body as aging goes on so it's it's not as if it hope, it's hopeless and it may very well have some part but i think it's it's interesting. I, I talked once to somebody who said, you know, the idea of the, uh, the DNA wearing down, the sort of metaphor of the candle burning down, this idea. This person said, you know, it seems to have a very deep appeal to people. And maybe this was partly why this idea caught on. Uh, you know, there's something about the metaphor that, that, that we like. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what can be done, what, what directions... Uh, this will all go. So the idea of telomerase, either turning it on or turning it off, um, has been talked about in sort of two separate realms. So people talk about um, the aging aspect and the cancer aspect. And I think that it's not two separate realms. It's really one and the same. Um, the aging realm that people talk about is that cells, cells have a limited capacity to divide. They um, only divide for a certain number of times and then they stop. Um, and then the cancer realm is that telomerase is needed for these cells, for cancer cells to keep on growing. It's really the same thing. If you take normal cells and allow them to divide more times than they normally would, then what you have is a cancer cell. Or potentially, that you at least have the potential for a cell that could divide um, more times than it should. Um, so I don't see these as a, as a dichotomy. I see them as, as really the same thing um, because I believe that the, the aspects in which telomerase is going to be important for, quote, aging will be um, really age-related disease. When you hear about it a lot of times in the media, you'll hear that telomeres have to do with aging, and people automatically think organismal lifespan. By changing the length of the telomeres, they're going to change how long the human species can live. And there are you know, books written about this and you know, fiction books that put telomerase in the middle of this, this whole thing. 
And there's no evidence that the telomere length really has anything to do with the organismal lifespan, but rather potentially with age-related diseases, that this inability of cells to divide indefinitely may play out in certain disease models. And so I certainly think that there's some implications in those diseases that are associated with aging that don't determine lifespan, but are age-related diseases, that there may be some role for telomerase to increase the lifespan of cells and therefore um, be able to ameliorate some diseases that require more cell divisions. And then the flip side is the, the cancer side. Um, it's pretty clear that, um, that, uh, that cancer cells, many cancer cells have activated telomerase. And it's been shown in a number of different systems that if you take cells that have short telomeres, as tumors normally do, and you inhibit the telomerase by a variety of mechanisms, that telomeres get short and then the cells die. So that's a very good basic um, set of experiments that suggest that, in fact, when telomeres are short, cells die. And so you might be able to target telomerase in certain cancers um, for um, telomerase inhibition um, being a cancer chemotherapeutic. I think that the error that people make, and it's, a, it's a, again, a generalization, um, we talk about cancer all the time as if it's a disease, when, in fact, cancer is not one disease. It's a whole bunch of different related diseases, all of which um, have to do with the um, increased ability of cells to divide. Um, and so I don't think that, um, as has been written in some press accounts, that uh, telomerase is the, the final magic bullet that will finally cure cancer, but rather that there will be certain cancers in which inhibition of telomerase may play a very key role. But what one needs to do now is to go and find out what are those particular diseases where inhibition of telomerase might play a role. Uh, and that's really the next step. A lot of the basic um, uh, cell biology um, has been worked out to suggest there is some promise here, and now some of the more clinical um, studies need to be, uh, be carried out. Well, we're still interested in a lot of the basic questions. Um, and uh, we've created some tools, um, for instance, a mouse that completely lacks the telomerase enzyme, uh, where we can find out what happens in um, a normal organism in the absence of telomerase. And it turns out that we, we initially created that tool um, as a means to get to the cancer question. What happens if a mouse doesn't have telomerase? Can it get cancer? Um, but we find that with that tool, we can ask some really fundamental questions about what happens when a chromosome loses its telomere. Um, does it fuse to other chromosomes? Yes, as we um, expected it would. And what chromosomes does it fuse to? And what is it that, that determines which chromosome fuses to which. Very basic questions about how telomeres normally function. Um, and so we have these tools, and we're having a, a really good time sort of trying to think of um, some of the fundamental questions that we want to ask um, that's going to be true probably for, for many cells, if not all cells, in terms of how um, they maintain chromosome integrity during normal cell division. Yeah, the whole thing is open, um, but we're not really getting into the clinical side of things. We're not working with inhibiting telomerase in human tumors. There are a large, lot of major pharmaceutical companies, some biotech companies that are out there doing that, and we're happy to talk to them. Um, but that's not really um, where I think my strengths are. Um, what I really like to be able to do is come into the lab and have an idea, I wonder how that works, and go and do it. And there are so many... Um, areas right now in um, how our chromosomes maintain during cell division and how do the telomeres play a role in that, um, that I can probably ask questions for still a number of years and still be excited by the, the very fundamental questions. Um, and so that's you know, sort of where I see, see our work going. One thing teaching makes you very, very clearly aware of is if you don't really understand something and think about it, you will never be able to teach it. So um, particularly starting at Berkeley, uh, where you know I really had to learn how to teach undergraduates pretty early on. And that took a lot of work. That was a, that was a fairly daunting uh, thing to have to teach undergraduates at Berkeley without any kind of real training for it. And I remember feeling pretty under pressure <laughs> while I was doing that. But, you know, it was worth going through that kind of crucible because, <laughs> because it was something that taught me a whole lot 
and I learned the hard way. I have to say, you know, I made a lot of mistakes in, in how I went about it. Um, poor students had to put up <laughs> with a lot, but but I but but you know, I, I realized that it's so important that if you teach then it means that you've understood it and then you've cleared your brain and you've forced your brain to think about it and that's really good for the science. So I think the two just go so much hand in hand, you know, the science and the teaching and then the students, uh, you know, they come back with wonderful ideas. There's always this back and forth between, uh, you know, you the teacher and the people who you're supposedly teaching. Very much a two-way street. The ability to ask a question, to, to um, be curious about something, and get in and get the tools to answer it, and that nobody else knows that. It's something completely known. It's not like going to the library and looking something up. Um, it's more probably the equivalent of some sort of a synthesis. Um, to be the first one to really understand something, and um, it's, it's fun. Um, and a lot of times, and it started out um, with, with telomerase in the early days, basically any experiment I would decide to go in and do in the lab would be totally new, wouldn't be anyone else doing it, and I could just go and play. Well, as it is now, um, Liz and I have both sort of created um, our own competition in a fairly large way. I mean, the, um, the graph of the number of publications with the title telomerase in it, you know, starts off very low and then, you know, goes up more than exponentially. Um, so there are, you know, four or five hundred already in 2,000 publications um, with this title, whereas, you know, when we started out there was maybe one or two per year. Um, so as a result, there are some, um, there are a lot of other labs that are now doing this and a lot of other really good labs that have switched their labs over and weren't studying telomerase and now are. Um, and so, I always tell myself, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> there are some really good people that are now doing this. But as a result, there are some experiments that, you know, we do, but it turns out somebody else has already done them before us. So what we think we could, you know, um, do to still have the kind of, you know, fun uh, doing it is do things that maybe aren't the obvious things that are maybe so directly clinically related. We can work with other people to do that. Um, but try and find areas that are still really interesting where we can come in and just design an experiment and, and, and do it on our own. I don't think there are any particular ethical issues per se in the kind of basic research that we do in the lab. So um, it's not something that I deal with in my own research day to day, but I am on the National Bioethics Advisory Commission. And one of the issues that have come up recently is the issue of stem cells. Um, there's a lot of um, experiments that one can do. It turns out with these very um, early cell types, the idea would be to take these cell types and differentiate them into particular kinds of cells, for instance, neurons to treat Parkinson's or um, pancreas cells to treat uh, diabetes. Um, and telomerase plays in there in a, in a certain realm because these stem cells have telomerase or people have proposed putting telomerase back, although in most of them it's already there. Um, so it doesn't really touch that much on my day-to-day -day research, um, but the, the, the issues uh, uh, play into the abortion debate because uh, there are questions about if one were to use human embryos, which is where some of these stem cells come from. Not all of them. There are other ways to get these stem cells. Um, and so it's been very interesting to be involved in the, uh, the various debates. Um, um, uh, one of the, the uh, arguments that at least we've come up with on the, the um, Bioethics Advisory Commission is that there is a lot of, um, a, of sort of a store of frozen embryos that are uh, around that people had for inter infertility reasons that aren't, they aren't going to be used. Um, and that that source would be a reasonable source ethically that one could then use in the treatment of disease with the, the aim of the treatment of disease. So um, I certainly am a, a proponent of having uh, basic scientists be able to do experiments with those kinds of stem cells. The cloning and the stem cells also go together because um, cloning, um, strictly speaking, is taking a nucleus out from one cell and putting another nucleus in. So for a lot of these stem cell applications, what people are talking about 
is um, if you have a particular disease like a um, like uh, diabetes, and we want to um, take these cells and differentiate them into cells to treat you, the best thing would be if they were immunologically very similar, so you don't have the graft rejection kinds of problems. And in order to do that, right now the most straightforward way it would be to use a kind of a cloning technique where you put the nucleus inside this cell. Um, now that's not what people typically think of when they think of cloning. They think of ger generating new organisms. Um, and so that's a somewhat different issue. I don't know that is where cloning is going to take us. What, one of my immediate concerns is that there is a lot of potential for the cell-based kinds of cloning. And so I don't want us to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think that one can certainly say that you wouldn't want to clone a human being in terms of implanting a cloned uh, embryo into a human, into a, a female, and, and having them give birth to a child. And that's a very different kind of a thing than using cells in culture. Um, and the problem is that the terminology it gets a little bit muddied. And so I think that we need to speak a little bit more specifically, um, certainly um, gener generating uh, individuals the way uh, Dolly was generated as an individual um, uh, sheep, in her case, but individual people, um, I would think that we would, we would want to definitely avoid that. But curing diabetes and Parkinson's and these other things, and I think that it, it's not one or the other. I think that one can um, put certain uh, ethical regulations on the, uh, what we called on the, on the NBAC, um, uh, colloquially baby making, the baby making side of cloning. You know, one can regulate that, or not regulate it, but essentially say that one won't do that um, and still be able to get these other uses um, out of the cells. I feel very much a, a recipient of it. I grew up in Australia and, uh, and then did my PhD in Cambridge in England. And I had a wonderful time being in a scientific environment there where you know, there was lots of interchange of ideas and, and it was a very exciting time to be doing the kind of science that I was doing. But I also strongly felt that, that the possibilities would be much more limited in Britain to do science. And at the time uh, when I was at this research laboratory in Cambridge in England, a lot of uh, American postdoctoral fellows, sometimes students, would be coming and spending a few years doing research because it was a very good place to do research of this kind then. And and I picked up on this sense, you know, that that uh, that this you know this was a good place to be doing science because of the sorts of people I could see, uh, you know, and and worked with, and one of whom actually became my husband. So I met my husband, who's a Californian in uh, in England, and he was one one of these people too. And, uh, and so I just kind of knew that I wanted to come to the US to do science because I did feel that also as a woman and also the British sort of system was such that you had to be kind of much more into it. And in Australia, I felt much more constrained. Um, and so, so this was definitely, you know, the possibilities both as, as a person, as a, you know, even apart from my personal life, Fortunately, it did coincide, but it was very much a situation where I could see the U.S. would be the place to be doing science. And so it, it was just a wonderful opportunity. And, and so I had the great good fortune of being able to do research at Yale first as a postdoctoral fellow and then to go to the University of California at Berkeley for, for 12 years. And uh, what a gift to be given you know, a laboratory and to be told, look, hey, you can do research. And what, what a wonderful thing to be having that opportunity. So, so I very much feel I, I was a recipient of that. And I think you know, living as I do in the West and living in the um, Bay Area, where the air is just filled with people excited about the future. Right now, it's the dot com, the internet, and so forth. But all of this sort of permeates. There's a lot of interest in biotech. Some of it's very commercial. And, uh, but I think much of the frontiers are intellectual and exciting science frontiers, too. You, know, you don't need to do commercial things to have exciting challenges. So my p personal preference has been in the scientific ones. And so part of it is also, I think, particularly that kind of sense that one gets in a place like California of lots of interesting uh, possibilities and, and that, you, know, that you, can, you can do things that don't have to be done the way they were before. We're very much interested 
more in you know the telomere and telomerase as a, as a, uh, a sort of a dynamic system in which there's a two-way conversation between the telomere and the cells. The telomeres do certain molecular things, and then cells respond, and then the cell talks back to the telomeres. So there's this dynamic conversation before uh, that's going on, which before we tried to get things reduced down to their simplest, just to even get a handle on it. And now, uh, instead of thinking of um, you know, collections of DNAs and proteins and collection of RNA and proteins, because telomerase is a, an RNA protein enzyme, uh, we're now trying to think of it as a very dynamic process. And that's more complicated, but then there are also many more tools in biology. Um, to, you know, there's chip technologies of various kinds of things that you can do now, which you could never have done a short while ago. And so there are ways we can answer these much more difficult next level questions. So there's a fascination with how this works, but now I think there's this sort of dynamic aspect to it, which, which I, I like and which I think is, you know, where biology is more taking us. We're now seeing more and more the complexities and starting to venture into trying to deal with them. And the other side of what we do is we are very interested in how this does relate to cancer cells. And so while we do experiments in simpler organisms where we can get fast answers, um, and they're complicated enough as they are, we also are trying to apply certain of these questions directly into human cancer cells and say, what can we learn there? Because there may be directions that could be eventually, eventually, you know, down the line, perhaps therapeutically useful. It would be wonderful to see, you know, so maybe all this medical background, you know, is starting to sort of sneak out again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, everybody probably dreams that their research might do some concrete good, right? And, uh, you know, but you also know it's a long, a long road because drugs and therapeutics don't just, you know, fall into your lap. They're, they're tough. Humans are complex. And things that work in cells, things that work in molecules really well, it's very complicated how it plays out in the whole human body. And uh, so, you know, we can have great hopes, but we also know that things may never work out in quite the same way that we planned. But I have a hunch that they'll work out in some way, but I'm just not exactly sure how it would play out. And the scientist in me says, well, I hope it turns out to be in some completely different direction, you know, because that would be very intellectually interesting to see you know, what else is going on. But, you know, it would, be, it would be good to see it turned into something um, beneficial.